yeah. I'll say what I think, but then I want to hear what you think too. I think religious pluralism is the most significant challenge that we have to face. Can you define? Religion? Yeah, oh, yeah, I will. Okay. The the idea that Christ and Christ alone is the way of salvation, the only way to God, is regarded by most students today as immoral. It is so bigoted and narrow-minded that if you even say that, you are just written off as some sort of a, a bigot. And it's really sobering when you go onto a campus to realize that a lot of these students look at me and they think, he's a bad man. This is a bad man because, because that one he position, believes yeah. that everybody who doesn't know Christ is going to hell. And that is just unconscionable. The, the idea of religious relativism or pluralism, I think, is the sort of conventional wisdom. And so the traditional Christian view that Christ is the only way uh, to God uh, is, is politically incorrect and um, just, I think, deeply part of students' consciousness today. And, and you're saying even, even bordering perceived as immoral. Yes, the, that's the, the yeah, of the opposition. That's that, and that's the big change that I've seen over the last 15, mm -hmm. 20 years, is that Christians now are not seen as goody two-shoes. They're seen as really immoral people. Christians are bad, wicked people mm -hmm. because of this. I, I had talked to one student on a campus a few years ago, and he kind of shocked me. He said, why is it? that you Christians come down on the wrong side of every moral issue that there is. And I thought, wow, he thinks I'm really a bad man, you know, a really wicked person. Mm -hmm. oh, that's sobering. It is. So what would you say? That's uh, scary, actually. <laughs> I, would, I would have said that and atheism is kind of the twin peaks uh, together. You need to know how to defend the, the existence of God. That there is no God. Like when you say that, are you, would you would you throw in people who believe in God as an energy as being atheist, or are you saying yeah, God I, is I, a I, person? I would put it in a positive. We need to be able to make a strong case mm -hmm. for the existence of the real God, mm -hmm. and then be able to defend against the, the problem of evil primarily, and the claim that there are no good arguments for this for this God. And That's another sort of mantra of conventional wisdom, right? There's no evidence. All the guys we debate, that's their first point. I don't really need to give any arguments tonight. I, mean, I just need to show that his arguments are no good. They, they so the ball's in your court to entirely, completely. Yeah. Burden of proof entirely on the Christian is what they assume. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you need to be able to shift that burden of proof a little bit yeah. um, and then be able to answer what, if they do come forward with some arguments like the problem of evil. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the questions that comes up which is kind of related to I mean, if there is a God, then he's obviously uh, intolerant, unforgiving to send people to hell. And then yeah. one, one of the biggest ones is they can't reconcile the God of the Old Testament who, you know, authorizes genocide and, you know, all, all the different things that obviously it look like it goes untouched and actually encouraged. Um, that's one of the biggest questions that came up from our audience in our class that they're encountering, how would you go about addressing that's that? How the, do you go that's about one of the hottest testament. ones right now? Yeah, I it? think that issue is really, wow. really the really Old hot. Testament God versus the New Testament God, so to speak. Uh, more specifically, just what the Old Testament God was was like, mm -hmm. you know, and what you know, he's the perpetrator of genocide, you know, and so on. I just finished a book on the airplane on the way here by Paul Copan called "Is God a Moral Monster." And it's a book-length discussion of this very question. It's excellent. Hmm. I'd highly recommend it. Paul Copeland is God. Yeah. He, his discussion of slavery in ancient Israel is just brilliant. Uh, I, I've come to ha see that in an entirely different light. What he points out about that is that we Westerners think of slavery on the model of the uh, American South prior to the Civil War. Mm -hmm and it was brutal and inhuman and so forth and it's not what it was in ancient Israel it was actually an anti-poverty program they didn't have welfare they didn't have a government that could do public assistance and so they had this program of sort of indentured servanthood where you would uh, work off your debts for seven years rather than starve 
and be cast into poverty, and then after seven years, you'd, you'd be free of your debts and your obligations. And so it was actually a, a brilliant anti-poverty program wow. in, the, in ancient Israel. But I think, frankly, when judged by today's standards, does a lot better than what <laughs> modern welfare has done in the United States, even. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you could actually buy your way out of it as well, right? Yes, that's it, right. It, it wasn't a lifetime money, you didn't have to wait till the seventh year. Yeah. That's right. If you had done well, you could save up and uh, and get out early. Mm -hmm. well, that's right. Is, is there any um, emerging trends within, you know, the, the scholarly levels in the universities that you see emerging that could pose as a, as a big threat to Christianity having a place in places of higher learning you know like we, we have the ones in front of us but is there is there is there thought patterns that on the surface maybe don't look as threatening but they could lead to something over the next decade or so that would be very significant it's a big question so yeah. <laughs> well the very points that we were just talking about coming together I mean, could eventually push Christianity out of the university classroom because it's not only false, it's immoral, arrogant, intolerant, and, and uh, therefore uh, religious tolerance really, hmm. we shouldn't be valuing it as much as we are, we need to not tolerate these. Do, do you feel and see that now? Do you feel and see that push to push the, the Christian scholarly influence out? Do you think oh, Bill can answer the scholarly yeah, level more? I, I don't. I, I think that what Michael is putting his finger on would be more a kind of political danger than an academic danger. I don't see anything academically on the horizon that looks threatening. Um, the so we're, we're so still being included as is part of the overall views to yeah, consider. I, I still, yeah, I'm, ver I'm still very optimistic what I see happening in the academy in terms of the rise of Christian scholars and their influence. This whole new atheism is not an academic movement. This is in pop culture. People mm -hmm. like Hitchens and Sam Harris and Dawkins and so forth. This is not a movement that's occurring in the academy. It's, huh. it's occurring in pop culture. And so when I look at the academy, I see Christians doing good, solid work and being respected for it. Um, but I think what Michael said is I could well imagine a kind of political alliance between, say, the homosexual rights movement and these anti-Christian types to say that Christians are, are bigoted and deny other people their civil liberties and therefore they don't have a place, say, at the at the, the university in some way, or that their speech should be abridged and things. You know, I think they, there have the been attempts in, and, can, yeah, hate yeah, speech. Yeah. But I see that more as political. Here's one that might be, but I don't know very much about it, brain science. I could, I could well imagine that as artificial intelligence and brain science and neurology continues to advance, more and more people might become convinced that we're just machines and that we're mm -hmm. no different than computers or something like that and maybe um, begin to squeeze out even more of the soul. Right. Although it's hard to imagine it being squeezed out much more than it already is. Already is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, if anything, I see... I, I actually, I'm seeing some rather interesting new defenses of dualism in the academy, which is very exciting and unexpected. Can you define that quickly, the, the dualism? That there is a soul. Yeah. The soul is distinct from the body. Mm -hmm. And there are now some pretty impressive thinkers who are defending that point of view. But I know that the people who are into the neurobiology and all of that are pushing hard on that. And, and here's where it can affect religion. They claim that they can locate where in the brain the religious lobe is, and by stimulating it, you can have make people have religious yeah. experiences. Maybe someday we can just remove it and have peace. <laughs> 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 yeah, like John. Well, I, mean, I got told last night that we can actually cause people to experience a relationship with God by pushing certain parts of the brain. It was that specific? Well, I said no. The research doesn't show that that specific. You're <laughs> you're adding on to it here, but and one student said, "So you're a dualist?" Yes, I'm a dualist. Now they're just shocked. 
Oh, he's a dualist anymore in there. <laughs> in there. Do, do you see that with the rise of, of, of the new atheism, do you see a, a strong Christian voice growing up at the same time? Emerging? Oh, I think there's a renaissance in Christian apologetics going on mm-hmm. right now. And I don't think that's in response to the new atheism either. It was in I, existence I, beforehand. Yeah, because it, 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 was, it was going on before. Uh, it couldn't have arisen so quickly if it were just a response. It's just now surfacing a little bit more. And oh, <coughs> it's surfacing all over the place. Uh, this past year, 2010, we had three apologetics conferences that I spoke at, one in Sacramento, one in Dallas, and one in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And at each one of them, over 1,500 people registered to come to this conference to get wow. trained in apologetics. 1,500 people at each one, and the level of enthusiasm is just through the roof. It is, it's really amazing the hunger that's in the grassroots out there. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah. But a lot of Christian leadership are on board with that. I've been trying to get mm-hmm. that same type of apologetic training happening across Do you think Canada it's a generational thing years. that people are coming up, they believe these things, but they're, fine, they're getting to a place that maybe the previous generation didn't so much that we want to, we want the core. Yeah, there may there may be some generational differences. A lot of people that have been in Christian leadership in the last 10 to 15 years in seminary have been influenced by the whole postmodern thinking mm-hmm. that truth's not important anymore. That's not where people are at. Don't bother with that. Anything to do with truth, just tell them stories. And you know, everyone's going through that. I think we're beginning to come out of that now. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, guys like Charles Colson and James Dobson are on board with the yep. mm-hmm. apologetics. Yeah, emphasis. no, I wasn't thinking of those. Type. I'm thinking of um, people younger than them. Oh, younger. Younger than mm-hmm. yeah, the the generation after them. I see. Who would criticize Dobson mm-hmm. and Colson? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, more the emerging church generation. Yep. Yeah, yeah I think they're going to become an irrelevancy. I think it's already waning yeah. a bit. Yeah. It seems that they've kind of Whereas they've had their day. Apologetics is just snowballing. I mean, through the ministries of people like Lee Strobel, Ravi Zacharias, Hugh Ross, mm-hmm. and others, and a host of lesser names, uh, it's just really growing yeah. all over the place. Yeah, it does seem to be. So I'm picking up from you, just for some conclusion, then that uh, from the perspective of, of the position of academia towards Christianity that the pursuit of academia is not an opposition to Christianity. Would you agree? Do you see it? Oh, oh you, mean, you mean from the Christian point of view? Yeah, that, that, as, that as science evolves and as oh, philosophy right, right. evolves, no, no, that the Christian I, fact, position is becoming stronger, not weaker. I, I, I do think it is becoming stronger, but yeah. it's still a battlefield. I mean, it's still facing mm-hmm. tremendous opposition. But it's better than it was in the 1930s and 40s. So and Christians don't have to turn off their brains. No, exactly. Yeah. And one of the things we're actually praying for during Michael and my week here is not just conversions or Christians being mobilized. We're actually praying that God will call out one student this week to feel led to do a Ph.D. and go on for doctoral studies in, in some area and serve the Lord as a Christian scholar. Wow. So that's part of our vision too is Great. to elicit those kind of responses. Great. That's, that's awesome. In closing, is there if you had any final comments to give to a class, if we were to give a little clip of, of this to the class from yourself and, and, and from yourself, what would you say? Is I it, would say while you're doing your intellectual formation, do not neglect your spiritual formation at the same time. It's very important that you learn what it is to be filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, going to the Word, feeding yourself in prayer, meaningful worship, and all of these other aspects to building the kind of person that God wants you to be. And, And the intellectual component is just one component of this spiritual formation that you need to be involved in. So it's very important they not neglect that, I would say.